Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We apologize for the delay in starting this session. And nobody can, can replace Dr. Muhammad Al Misfar, but it seems that uh, for uh, uh, circumstances beyond his control, he is unable to attend. So they organizers asked me to chair this session on his behalf. We will start with Dr. Hassan Al-Azzi, who is a, 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 a lecturer in political science in the Lebanese University, and uh, he's a visiting lecturer to many French uh, institutes, uh, and he has, uh, he, he obtained his PhD from Rain University. He will be presenting on democratic transformation in Eastern Europe. This paper will try to make a comparison in the last uh, decade of the last century and uh, the political uh, transformation which uh, some countries have witnessed and as a result of which uh, a new environment politically, economically and socially, socially has been created. Studies uh, specializing in the affairs of democracy are divided into two. Some deal with uh, the conditions leading to democracy. The second opinion says that any, any democratization will depend on external forces rather than internal forces. Of course, uh, uh, sometimes the people make a distinction between liberalization and democratization. We have no time to go into details, but undoubtedly the internal situation or the environment in Eastern Europe was conducive to democratic change. Peoples were uh, eager to get rid of communism, but at the same time, the external factors were very decisive and important because the Soviet Union at that time would even use um, military force to put an end to any attempt at democratization. We remember the, the Budapest Spring, the Prague Spring. But uh, as soon as Moscow's grip on these countries started to loosen, democratization began. In the Arab countries, the situation is conducive to the Arab masses went out on the streets spontaneously without any exterior, external help. So therefore, in both cases, Eastern Europe and Arab countries, the internal situation was conducive. But uh, the external factor played a different role in these two cases, Eastern Europe and uh, Arab Spring countries. We must mention here that uh, uh, thinkers uh, differ in their opinions in analyzing uh, this, uh, this phenomena, but most of them, they agree that uh, the phase of uh, consolidation of democracy to become a sustainable uh, democracy is the most important after the, the two preceding phases of changing the political system and uh, transition into a democratic system. And uh, democratic transition is a long 
process and uh, it can be subject to changes and setbacks and if there is a need for sponsorship and help from the outside to protect it at least if not to help and support it this has happened in uh, many revolutions and the French Revolution is a vivid example when it uh, moved from a revolutionary state to a dictatorship and so on and so forth. Democratic transition globally has faced two problems. One is the one pertaining to values and interest. United States, for example, upholds uh, uh, these values. Since the days of Thomas Jefferson until now, no presidential statement was free from mentioning these values. The United States uses them in setting out its foreign policy, sometimes negatively, sometimes positively, sometimes as a pretext to intervene in the affairs of others. Despite the Americans bragging about their values of freedom, etc., but Washington never shied away from allying itself with a dictatorial regime, Salazar in the Portugal, the Franco in Spain, the Turkish generals, Greek generals, etc., and because uh, the Americans say that not all dictatorships are uh, uh, enemies of the United States, but all enemies of the United States are dictators. And uh, also, th th there was support to some autocratic regime because the United States uh, had interests with them. As for the United States uh, position vis-a-vis -vis what happened in Eastern Europe, I have no time to delve into many details, but it suffices to say that the United States in its uh, struggle against the Soviet Union used everything at its disposal apart from military confrontation due to a state of nuclear balance or deterrence. And uh, also, when it comes to democratic transition in Eastern European countries, uh, the United States supported uh, the enemies of the dictatorial regimes, the communist regimes, and uh, uh, the, the Poland uh, example is a good one. The Americans hope that the Polish case Will, be, will start a domino effect uh, and uh, also uh, the forms of pressure pro applied by the United States against the Soviet Union varied. Uh, even they helped the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the Star Wars project, and also the contacts between President Reagan and Pope John Paul II, who was uh, of Polish origin, help the Gdansk uh, Solidarity uh, Trade Union, and so much so that uh, this trade union became richer than the Polish state, and uh, at the time when uh, the Soviet Union was suffering from all sorts of problems and the Polish state was also facing, facing many problems. President Reagan declared a direct confrontation with the Soviet Union within the policy of containment which uh, came into effect since the days of President Truman. The Soviet Union on its part was exhausted uh, because of the Afghanistan campaign and Gorbachev through the policy of uh, perestroika and glasnost and, uh, and uh, uh, the evil uh, Soviet empire 
was going through so much difficulty that in the end it collapsed. The Polish regime collapsed and that was followed by a domino effect. But what I'm trying to stress here that changing governments does not necessarily mean a democratic transition. These countries, when they changed from one political system to another, they enjoyed direct American support and there was what was called the conditionality, i.e. to use a policy of uh, encouraging and threatening and whatever. The United States uh, cooperated with Eastern European countries and nurturing these new regimes like a mother would nurture its newborn child. As for the Arab case, the Obama administration was surprised. I don't want to go back to the details, but uh, Anthony Lake, the uh, Clinton uh, national security advisor, declared a new policy of uh, spreading democracy in the rest of the world. Unfortunately, that did not include the Arab uh, countries, and the Clinton administration enjoyed good relations with all dictatorial Arab regimes, even the Syrian regime. And then came uh, the Greater Middle East project, which, uh, was, which failed uh, absolutely because of the United States problems with their allies before their enemies like uh, France, Germany, Spain, etc. Anybody who studied the democratic transition in Eastern Europe will recognize that uh, the United States uh, gained new allies and when the invasion of Iraq came, 10 new democracies from Eastern European countries sent a letter to President Bush supporting his invasion of Iraq, whereas his old allies were hesitant. As for the Arab case, Obama behaved with extreme pragmatism. His agenda did not have anything to do with democracy in the Arab world or anywhere else. He was uh, really surprised with what started to happen in Tunisia and uh, elsewhere. And the problem, the old conflict between values and interests came into existence. When Condoleezza Rice has solved that problem previously, the Obama administration had no doctrine. They were dealing with each case on its merit on a daily basis. There are many details we have no time for. I just want to move quickly to the conclusions. The two cases of East Germany and Arab countries, there is, uh, for example, Tunisia and Egypt are different than Yemen and other countries. The differences are similar to what happened in Eastern Europe. Uh, Poland was different than Czechoslovakia. Uh, for example, uh, in Czechoslovakia, the change was bloodless. In Romania, they executed Ceausescu. So and so forth. So people who say the Arab countries are different, Tunisia is different than Egypt, Egypt different than Syria, Syria is different than Bahrain, and we, we can uh, analyze this according to the, what we started by saying that internal conditions and external conditions. In the case of Eastern Europe, outside intervention was invested heavily in, uh, towards a democratic uh, transition. In the Arab world, this not, does not seem to be the case because there is a fear that uh, any proper elections in the Arab world will mean that Islamists will reach to power. And we remember what happened in Algeria at the end of the 80s, early 90s. 
And uh, when James Baker said, despite our belief in democracy and democratic values, we cannot support Islamists coming to power and the case of Hamas in 2006, and we know how, what the reaction, American reaction was that. And uh, when Hezbollah reached uh, power in Lebanon three elections, and this confirms the opinion that uh, uh, proper elections will bring Islamists to power, and you know what happened to the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, what's been happening since 2011 until now, and uh, American uh, hesitation uh, is uh, evident. They couldn't do a thing in Syria, and uh, in Libya they use the principle of leading from behind with, by using air force and some UN resolutions. So all in all, America's interest in, or America's investment in the Middle East is a lot less than before. But what's even more important in Eastern Europe, there was no oil involved. The United States wanted, didn't, didn't, want, didn't have an interest in keeping the flow of oil free and the prices at a reasonable level from its point of view. We have Israel in this part of the world. Israel has been always an obstacle to democratic transition in the surrounding areas. And maybe what's even more important, in Eastern European countries, they more or less were unanimous in adopting a new system, a new model, a Western one and an American one in particular, and uh, people behind this project invested uh, heavily politically, diplomatically, materialistically, strategically. The United States cannot invest anything in any Arab democratic transition simply because there is, there is no particular model that all Arab revolutions agree on. Yes, uh, maybe the market economy was uh, the not a uh, problem as, as far as uh, any democratic transition is concerned, and it's not the case like this European countries, but the political model here after the Arab revolutions, now we see an open struggle in the market of ideologies, if we can call it that. We see an Islamist module, but we don't know which one, a moderate one, an extremist one, a jihadi one, a Muslim Brotherhood one, and also in the other camp, the liberals and the secularists, they have struggles between them. Now the door is wide open to all these kinds of confrontations, and this is really hindering any outside investment in a change which may not lead to maintaining the interests uh, and the whole problem of uh, the conflict between uh, values and interests is coming back. And also, uh, what Condoleezza Rice has said in, at Cairo University years ago, when she said that they were wrong in siding with the stability against values or whatever. And the problem is we do not have an agreement on which agreement we want to move to. And uh, the Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis this change are always taken into account when it comes to any American decision. Number three, the conditions here are different. Uh, we have an American administration which does not have democratic transition as an item on its agenda compared to previous uh, administrations like what happened in Eastern European case and when in the phase of consolidating democratization in Eastern Europe and the latest country to join the EU, Latvia, 
and Croatia, and uh, as soon as they become members, they get immediate uh, help uh, to, uh, to fulfill the conditions. So this is a direct help from the immediate uh, neighborhood uh, and the United States to help these countries, whereas we remain open to any possibilities and many possibilities, including going backwards and facing setbacks. And the United States in 2014 does not have the word democracy featuring in its State of the Union presidential address or any statements by the State Department's uh, statements compared to 2013, 2012, 2001, when the word used to feature uh, a lot. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. And we hope that the American officials will remember democracy in their statements. Three minutes only, and we will give uh, priority to those who send us uh, their names to uh, the chairperson in order to make it easier for you to take the floor. Any observations, any comments, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Ghassan. One of the main issues you have raised when you were speaking about democratization and democratic transition is the difference between values and interests. As Dr. Ghassan has mentioned, this is one of the main problems we are facing. The United States, um, we have the United States, as uh, Ms. Condoleezza Rice mentioned in 2005 in the AUC, she said, for 60 years, my country, the United States, has traded freedom, democracy, and democracy for security and stability. And after 60 years, we have achieved neither. So this summarizes that the U.S. does have values and principles, but also interests. And when it comes to real politic, we always have interests that outweigh interests, um, values, sorry, and principles that the United States uh, always uh, sings about. Is the world still convinced, do you believe? Do people still believe? Do the elite and government still believe that the United States are true supporters of democracy after having uh, uh, for long supported autocratic governments in the Philippines, in Europe, in Latin America, and other countries? What is the lesson we draw here? And you've established a comparison between the European and the Arab cases. What lessons can and we draw from the current U.S. position. We see them now. Uh, we see now that democracy is propelling Islamists into power. Not only did the United States give up on the government in Algeria, I think I've heard the speaker say, but also the uh, France and Europe uh, followed suit. How does this help strengthen and consolidate democracy? We have seen. Uh, an American reluctance and helplessness in this regard. How do you see the future of an American role? Thank you. Dr. Ghassan will answer the question at the end of the session. We will now give the floor to Dr. David Pollock. He is a fellow professor and focuses on the Middle Eastern policies. He worked as a first advisor uh, when it comes to Middle Eastern issues in the Secretary of State, and he spoke about democracy and reform in the Middle East. He was a visiting professor at Harvard University and assistant professor in Georgetown, Washington. He has a PhD from Harvard University. You have the floor, sir. 
thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to speak in English, uh, which is easier for me, although I can uh, try to respond in Arabic, if you like. My, my comments are uh, actually, a, I think, a good follow-up to the question that was just asked, or the comments that were just made from the floor, because in my view, the evolution of U.S. policy toward the Arab Spring, or toward Arab revolutions or uprisings, is exactly a tale of tension between ideals and interests. The ideals are about democracy, human rights, elections, pluralism, and the like. The interests have more to do with short-term regional stability and conflict management, energy and other economic resources, alliance relationships, credibility, and power rivalries, and direct security factors such as weapons proliferation or counterterrorism. For example, in early 2014, this year, the United States was pursuing interest-based deals in Geneva with both Iran and Syria, two long-time brutal dictatorial enemy regimes. At the same exact time, the United States was estranging itself from Egypt, a long-time major and relatively mildly autocratic ally for failing to fulfill democratic values. This is an example, to my mind, of the tension, or you could call it, I think quite understandably, hypocrisy or inconsistency in American policy toward the ideal of democracy and the reality or the interests of security in the region. Anyone who compares President Obama's major speeches of May 2011 and of September 2013, or his most recent speech at West Point just a month ago, will see how interests have slowly but surely come to precede ideals. In May 2011, President Obama said at the State Department, quote, first, it will be the policy of the United States to promote reform across the region and to support transitions to democracy, unquote. That was number one on his agenda three years ago. Yet by late last year, in his revealing address at the UN General Assembly, the president had demoted democracy to a distant second place, far behind what he called the American core interests, the Iranian nuclear problem and the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Neither of which, by the way, appears close to resolution today. And in his latest speech a few weeks ago, Mr. Obama had very little to say about Arab democracy at all. But sitting here in Doha, it is plain for all to see that the United States is not now, in fact, actively promoting democracy in this particular part of the region. So what I would like to do in the remainder of my comments is to make some general points about what I think is the reality of U.S. policy as it reflects this tension between ideals and interests in the region. First, and most important in my view, Arab democracy or Arab revolutions 
or the Arab Spring are primarily, and here I refer to the remarks also on the panel by the preceding speaker, these issues are primarily internal, not American. In fact, the United States has played a modest and currently even decreasing role in this entire major series of upheavals in the Arab world. Despite all the widespread conspiracy theories that I know have a powerful hold on imagination in the reading, in the region, and I'm told you heard one of those conspiracy theories yesterday here at this conference, the reality is that U.S. influence is quite limited and U.S. policy is mostly reactive or even defensive rather than proactive and certainly not decisive except in very rare cases like Libya. A very significant limit on American influence lately is the domestic political environment in the United States. War weariness in the White House, in Congress, and in American public opinion. A general preoccupation with internal economic and social challenges rather than foreign policy an unusually polarized partisan atmosphere, even on traditionally bipartisan foreign policy questions, a sense of emerging energy independence, and in foreign policy, a desire on the part of the administration to, as they call it, pivot to Asia, which is not happening after several years of talk, but is still, I think, the underlying desire of the Obama administration, rather than to continue being dragged in to endless interventions here in the Middle East. Notably, in the one case of a largely peaceful, relatively successful transition from revolution to Arab democracy lately, and that is Tunisia. The United States is playing at most a marginal supportive role. Nevertheless, the birthplace of the Arab Spring in Tunisia is teaching the region, I think, another valuable lesson. That it is possible, at least in principle, for a popularly elected Islamist government to relinquish power peacefully. It may be that Tunisia's exceptionally secular society makes it an unlikely model for any other Arab country. That trait is what deprived Ennahda of an absolute majority in the country's first free elections two years ago, and also what ultimately pressured Ennahda into resigning from power several months ago. But the key point for this discussion is that the United States had precious little to do with any aspect of Tunisia's success so far. Second, the truth is that not all Arab states are in upheaval. In fact, many are not. Many are stable. From Morocco and Algeria in the far west to Gaza, the West Bank, and Jordan in the center, to the GCC countries here, in the south and east, stability or even stagnation is the norm. One could say that the monarchies, 
except for Bahrain, plus Algeria and the Palestinians, are riding out the storm better than the republics. Oil and gas revenues, direct or indirect, are a big part of the reason. But Morocco proves that this cannot be the only issue. I believe that contrary to common misconception, these quieter cases deserve as much analytical attention as the noisier ones. I also believe that US policy is at least implicitly intended to help keep these cases quiet. By providing some extra economic or diplomatic support, by encouraging greater regional cooperation, and most of all, by refraining from rocking the boat with any serious outside demands for democratic reform. This is a very important, though almost always overlooked, aspect of recent US policy toward the region. Third, US policy seems to me to have evolved in an ad hoc, case by case, even contradictory fashion, not as the outcome of some grand strategy, and certainly not as the result of some secret lobbies or pressure groups inside the United States. And I know because I work at a think tank that tries to influence US policy, and after three and a half years of trying to convince the US government to intervene more strongly in favor of the Syrian opposition, I know how limited the influence of outside advocacy or analysis institutions is in Washington. So when I say that US policy has evolved in a reactive, ad hoc, inconsistent fashion, I think this is what the reality of the region imposes on the United States, not the other way around. The US is reacting to different situations in different countries, to surprises like what is happening right now in Iraq, to different lessons learned or mistakes made at different times, to different policy and bureaucratic priorities of key US policymakers, to the tension between ideals and interests, and most of all, to the realization, I think correctly, that the US has only a very limited influence on internal developments in individual Arab countries, and that its role is constrained by opposing interests in the region. And I'm just going to end with one very current example. I know my colleagues will talk about Egypt and Syria, and there's much that I could say about that, but I want to focus instead just in two sentences on what's going on right now in Iraq. I am uncertain, personally, about exactly what the United States will or will not do in the face of the new Iraqi crisis. But more important, I am certain that the US administration is uncertain about what exactly to do in this crisis. One reason for that is the emphasis, I think personally, the overemphasis of American policy on counterterrorism as compared with all of the other interests and values that we have in the region. But another reason is that US policy in Iraq today runs the risk of doing something in Iraq that might appear to serve American interests and American values, but would also be opposed 
by many American friends right here in the GCC. Perhaps not here in Qatar, but in other countries in the Gulf. Because I know that even though the United States, I think in general, views ISIS in Iraq as a terrorist organization and views the Maliki government as a potential ally worth supporting, I know that many people here in the Gulf view what's happening in Iraq not as Islamic extremism or terrorism against a legitimate government, but as, on the contrary, a popular uprising by the Sunnis in Iraq against an illegitimate Iranian-supported proxy government in Baghdad. And this is a microcosm, a small but important current example of exactly the sort of tension that defines American policy. The tension that comes from opposing interests and values here in the region, not in Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pollock. Uh, Shukran, Dr. Pollock. Now we have Dr. Radwan Ziada, who is the executive director of the Syrian Center for Strategic Studies in Washington and uh, senior uh, fellow at ISBU in Washington and also the director of the Damascus Center for Human Rights <coughs> and the chairman of the Syrian Transitional Justice Committee. Thank you, Dr. Ravid. I will not uh, repeat what uh, other uh, speakers said yesterday and today when it comes to American policy, to Obama's foreign policy towards the Middle East. But what I will try to discuss is the main question regarding the American position vis-a-vis -vis Syria. The question is, is there, is there a different American foreign policy towards the Arab world after the Arab Spring? The answer simply is not. Why should there be one? We can say that what happened in the Arab world since 2011 are the biggest changes in the Arab world since the independence era of the 1940s. And therefore, the Arab countries have not witnessed uh, social uh, protest movements or revolutions of this magnitude since that they would change the relationship between dictatorial regimes and uh, people, and also consequently their outside relations with uh, the United States and other countries. So although this was a major component in the changes the Arab world has witnessed, the American policy, however, has no change. How can we uh, evaluate uh, the six years of the Obama administration and its foreign policy when uh, we compare uh, the American administration, Obama's administration, compared to President Bush and uh, the EU, uh, President Obama was uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He visited uh, Brussels and uh, Europeans. You seem to be much happier with the Obama administration's foreign policy, a lot more than President Bush's one. And also in America's relations with Africa, Central Africa and others, you'll see in Tanzania, Rwanda, South Africa, you see the pictures of uh, President Obama everywhere. And uh, although the financial uh, 
situation and the America, American financial aid to Africa was probably bigger in the days of the Bush administration. As for the Middle East, we can simply categorize the Obama's policy in the Middle East with one word, and that is failure. Uh, total failure in Syria when Ambassador Ford resigned three weeks ago because uh, he said something like he resigned because he could no longer defend the American position which is no longer consistent with American values especially when we remember the uh, large number of people being killed or the spillover of the crisis into the neighboring areas. And even those uh, who cited the moral aspect here, like Samantha Power, who is very close to President Obama, and she wrote some of the most important books on the history of genocide. When we take abstracts from what she used to write and the positions she currently holds, we see a clear contradiction. She used to say that the moral imperative should, should uh, come first and things to this effect, but compared that to American foreign policy towards Syria, we see a total contradiction. Iraq is another failure, especially in view of recent events. Iraq is on the verge of a civil war. Half of the Iraqi population at least does not see the current government as one which is good enough to unite the country. Also, the ISIL is considered to be even more extreme than Al-Qaeda, and despite what they are doing in northern Syria, Raqqa, and, and Iraq, and also this moral failure in Syria, and the security failure in Iraq, and the political failure in the Ukraine, we know President Obama uh, started reassessing the relations with Russia, and now in view of what's been happening in the Ukraine, we'll see that even that policy is facing extreme criticisms in view of uh, Washington's inability to face up to what Russia is doing in the Ukraine. So, what are the practical uh, causes or roots of American or Obama's foreign policy? To start with, even in his days of the, as a senator, he had not much interest in foreign policy. Maybe he had one visit to Africa and one to Israel. And at the same time, he, he held no executive positions of power. He was not a governor or anything like that. And that may, that may explain his hesitance on dithering. And he, in both terms, first and second, he chose two powerful personalities to head his foreign policy, and like uh, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry. And the reason was to give these two individuals powers to move without him having to play a major role in this policy. Of course, ultimately, the decision is his. So therefore, both the personalities always find themselves in an awkward situation when they do not enjoy the White House's support when it comes to certain decisions they wanted to take. This was evident in the Syrian crisis when Hillary Clinton said that the administration should provide uh, weapons to the opposition. Obama's position was against it strongly. And the same thing was repeated with Kerry when 
carry in a policy meeting to assess the policy towards Syria, carry with four military strikes against the Syrian regime to encourage the opposition on the ground and the change calculation policy to change uh, Assad's uh, calculations on the ground. But this was also uh, opposed by President Obama. So although we have two strong personalities at the head of American diplomacy, they did not get the support they needed at crucial moments. Also, when it comes to the American foreign policy towards the Middle East, we all know that the United States has no colonial history in the Arab world. So this should give it a better position to, to formulate its policy when the Laurie King a mission in 1917 came to Syria and the Levant on the Wilson principles on self-determination. Their final report said something that the Syrians reject any form of foreign intervention, especially the French mandate. And also, if the League of Nations wanted some form of uh, a mandate, then the Syrians will accept an American mandate and not a French one. This was in view of the Syrian people's uh, uh, belief in the principle of self-determination by Woodrow Wilson. But this was quickly changed by the American support of Israel and would change the image of the United States in almost all Arab societies later on. Although the determinants of American foreign policy remain the same and mainly to maintain stability and maintain the flow of oil and price of the barrel of oil and also to guarantee and secure Israel's security. And after 9-11, uh, the war on terror was added. And we see in Obama's latest speech in West Point, he more or less uh, repeated this uh, interest, which more or less confirms the fact that despite the Arab Spring revolutions, which should have rewritten the American uh, foreign policy, we found uh, American dithering and hesitance in recognizing the Arab people's right to change their political system through their, through their revolutions. The Obama's position was very hesitant. Obama did not even mention what happened in Tunisia until some two months later in a State of the Union address. The situation in Libya was somewhat different because the administration was pushed to interfere because of France and Britain mainly. But uh, the, three pe the three ladies who pushed President Obama to take this decision, Hillary Clinton, Susan Wright, and Samantha Bauer, the three ladies paid a heavy price for what they did in Libya later on. Clinton decided to resign, and there may be some investigations into her role as to what happened in the American embassy. Susan Rice also the same thing. Uh, also, that affair ruined her chances of becoming Secretary of State. And all these three ladies, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a military intervention in Syria, was impacted because of what happened in Libya. So therefore, how can we assess uh, Obama's foreign policy towards Syria, mainly we have to take into consideration that uh, there was no grand strategy 
after the Arab Spring to what happened compared to the Marshall Plan or what happened to the European Union to expand the membership to Eastern European countries and the EU play the crucial role in the democratization of Eastern Europe through encouraging them to build the institutions and in comparison, the Arab world has no such regional system through which they can manage uh, the process of change and democratization. The Arab League is the weakest uh, organization, and it's not democratic by any means. The situation in Egypt is different than Libya, than Syria, than uh, Tunisia. There is no proper institutions to encourage a process of transition into democracy. Also, President Obama was a about six months late until August 2011 to ask Bashar Assad to leave power because he lost his legitimacy. And there was a discussion at the time, what will happen if Bashar al-Assad decided not to listen to Obama? This, of course, uh, placed the administration and Obama's statement in another contradiction because when you do not follow your words with any necessary deeds on the ground, to change these uh, words into action, then they're more or less useless. Then after that, the administration started floating the idea of economic sanctions through the Forum of Friends of Syria, through some illusion that the Assad regime, when the economic sanctions are tightened and uh, to stop the flow of uh, money will uh, cause the regime to collapse. Uh, and at that time, uh, then Homs and Hama and other cities, the protest was getting larger. As a reaction, the regime went even further in attacking the civilian population arresting, detaining, and killing people. But for the following year and a half, the discourse of the administration had not changed. They kept repeating the same thing, that they will tighten the economic sanctions. And this was not uh, in line with what was happening on the ground and the huge gap between the large number of the people killed in Syria, which uh, passed the 100,000 mark and on the one hand, and the administration's continuous talk of, uh, of uh, sanctions and things and working through the Security Council, which were rendered useless because of the Russian and Chinese vetoes, and the administration failed in taking any further steps. Then the United States moved into providing non-lethal uh, help and support uh, to the opposition at a time when the humanitarian crisis became the biggest humanity has ever faced. Half of the population of Syria are either internally displaced or refugees outside the country. Nine million internally displaced inside the country and four million outside. And all of this was happening when the administration is insisting on the non-lethal assistance. And there was a window of opportunity to change this policy when the Assad regime used chemical weapons, the very thing that President Obama called a red line that should be punished, the regime should be punished for if uh, crossed. But uh, 
in less than 24 hours and by Russian sponsorship a deal was reached to, for the Assad to hand over his chemical weapons yet this did not deter Assad from using other weapons they, he still uses the chlorine gas lethally in many areas of Syria like Hama and Kafir Zeta and we can say in conclusion that the American administration, despite what it said about the right of Syrian people to self-determination, the administration has failed at the moral and political levels. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Radwan. We now give the floor to Mr. Muhammad al Manshawi, who will talk to us about the American policy towards Egypt after Ju the July 3, 2013 uh, uh, events. He is a uh, reporter with Al Shuruq newspaper in Washington, and he has a weekly uh, article. He has recently spoken about the situation in Egypt uh, before a committee uh, against terrorism in the United States, and he works as part as the UN Secretary General Initiative uh, for dialogue between civilizations. Thank you. I will try to be brief when it comes to talking about the American policy towards Egypt. I will speak about six main points when it comes to the American policy, without which we cannot understand this relationship. The relationship uh, started uh, in 1979, and this was a landmark uh, date uh, with the uh, signing of the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt. It seemed like a tripartite uh, relationship, U.S., Israel, and Egypt. So there was no independent U.S.-Egyptian relations. There was always the Israeli dimension to it. And that same year when the peace agreement was signed, the United States lost its historical Iranian ally that fell down uh, due to the Islamic Revolution. Therefore, the United States lost a huge powerful ally, Iran, and it was fearing uh, losing another big uh, country that is Egypt. We speak about three main pillars for this relationship. The first one, the main cornerstone, is the military aspect. In 2013, the average number of U.S. planes crossing the Egyptian skies were uh, of 100 planes a day. So this goes to show how important Egypt is as a military ally. Through the Suez Canal last year, 430 American ships transited through Suez, 30% uh, of which were military. We're talking about one ship every day. That is the, the rate, some of which bear nuclear weapons. And of course, uh, the number of ships go up when we have um, uh, regional tension and the military and I just know this all too well. The second pillar or cornerstone of this relationship has to do with an intelligence dimension uh, with the attempt against the World Trade Center. Uh, we have uh, Sheikh uh, Abdurrahman, the blind Sheikh, uh, was behind this. Therefore, co intelligence cooperation increased between the U.S. and Egypt, also after the attempt by Muhammad Atta, and recently the intelligence cooperation also doubled in uh, Sinai to protect Israel, of course. The third dimension or the third cornerstone of the relationship between the U.S. and Egypt 
has to do with the relationship with the Gulf. We have good relationship with the Gulf. We have not so good relationship with Iran, Hezbollah. All this uh, elicited the presence of a free Egypt and not a democratic Egypt. And this is one of the main points of contention when it comes to understanding the U.S.-Egyptian policy. One of the main officials of Mubarak's regime told me how bilateral agree, um, uh, meetings uh, took place. They would be speaking about different regional issues, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, oil, and uh, Suez Canal. And in the last five minutes, uh, the US officials would tell their counterparts, please take care of human rights and democracy. So this was only out of an ethical uh, commitment and not as a main cornerstone of the US-Egypt relations. <laughs> Then came the 25th of May events. A few months ago, uh, Hillary Clinton was talking in the uh, Forum of the Future and had warned uh, Arab governors from uh, confronting the current change after the birth of the Tunisian revolution. And she was warning those Arab governors not to stand against this new wave of change. She told them they will step into a quagmire. And the Ahmed Abu Ghid, the Egyptian foreign minister, and the Kuwaiti foreign minister were um, upset with her remarks. The events or the demonstrations of the 25th of May started, and the United States fell very um, confused. They adopted the wait and, let's wait and see approach. The U.S. administration's rhetoric escalated after what happened in Egypt. There was no a clear uh, position. There was uh, only confusion by Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. But after the Egyptians succeeded in establishing a new formula and expressed their wish to topple the regime, the U.S. position changed. However, the U.S. never truly called for toppling the regime just uh, as clearly as the Egyptians did. The, uh, an order of transition is what they came up with, the U.S., that is. An order of transition whereby Mubarak would play a crucial role. And when Suleiman was uh, selected as or appointed as vice president, this was a very good solution to the U.S. However, it didn't satisfy the Egyptians, and they continued taking to the streets. So there was a generational conflict between the realist Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Gates, Gates and Dennis Ross. Those people belong to an older generation. Uh, uh, they have known Mubarak, they have known the region, and they appreciate stability. However, the other uh, group was made up of Samantha Power and other uh, newer politicians. Uh, one of them is a U.S. ambassador in Russia, and Dennis McDow, who is 42 years of age, and another young politician who is less than 35 years of age. This group was an idealist group, and they tried to pressure Obama into uh, supporting and standing by the Egyptian people. So we had the idealists and the realists. This conflict, this tension between the two groups made Obama feel that he's standing before a historical moment that will burden the United States with this um, historical problem and con uh, a conflict between values and interests. And this could be a good opportunity to improve the image of the United States. During those times, Obama's personal appearance was very important. He addressed the Egyptian people three times contrary to what happened in 2013. Afterwards, a new term was coined, the SCAF, which is the military uh, 
Council and there was a very cautious welcome of this uh, council and there was also a very bad performance that, alien that uh, had it alienated a lot of its supporters. There were a lot of killings, uh, there were a lot of demonstrations, uh, also the virginity tests for girls, female demonstrators and the image of the naked girl that was uh, reproduced by all the uh, magazines and uh, newspapers of the world. Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, spoke before one center uh, in an annual ceremony and mentioned the Egyptian regime and dubbed them as senior citizens sitting in a dark room and uh, deciding what they want and not what the people want and it compared between Egypt and Syria or likened Egypt to Syria. This increased the U.S.-Egypt tension. What happened to the U.S. organizations working in Egypt? The Freedom House, NDI uh, uh, and ADI. There was a security attack against those organizations. They were closed down. A lot of their workers were uh, arrested, including U.S. citizens. One of them is the son of the Minister of Transport. Of course, there was a lot of uh, U.S. Uh, anger and ire, and a deal was reached. But of course, this didn't help with diffusing the tension between U.S. and Egypt. The attack was unprecedented in the history of the relationship. In mid-2012, Washington was surprised with the decision made by the military council that deprives the next president from all his powers and prerogatives. Washington called for immediate free elections. Afterwards, a new chapter started in the relationship between Washington and Morsi and the uh, Brotherhood relations. It said that the president should be freely elected and should get uh, the majority vote. This is what happened. Morsi was well welcomed. However, from this very moment, Counter-revolutionary forces started uh, attacking Morsi and taking an offensive uh, approach. These attempts also included revealing a lot of cases against Washington, and Washington had to adopt a defensive approach to counter this attack. After Morsi came to power, there was a lot of uh, concerns in the Congress to pressure Morsi into showing his intentions practically and not only theoretically. There were repeated U.S. visits in order to invest in a new Egyptian elite. It seemed for a moment that there was a new emerging Egyptian elite that Washington wants to support and mentor. And then there was the U.S. elections in November 2012. Republicans used the Egyptian, uh, uh, used the election, sorry, to talk about Obama's support to Islamists in Egypt. Then there was a, a crisis in Gaza where the Egyptian president uh, played a double role. He called on the ambassador and and deal to show his support to Gaza and the inhabitants of Gaza. At the same time, he was playing the role of a mediator, and he succeeded therein to seize, uh, uh, sorry, to reach a ceasefire. However, President Morsi uh, amended the Constitution a few days later. Washington was very upset with him, uh, and uh, dubbed these um, amendments, dictatorial amendments. Morsi always uh, asked to visit the United States, however, he was never granted the right to or he was never invited to visit the White House. I think the United States never allowed him to visit the United States uh, 
Even though they did recognize his legitimacy, the White House uh, denied any claims that any invitation was sent to the president. Then there was the military coup. However, a few days earlier, there was an American study spoke of multiple options viable. However, any military intervention is not viable. Yet, the intervention occurred. Washington did not call this a military coup, however, because this would mean that they will have to put an end to their military assistance to Egypt. Washington also confirmed that uh, no oppression should be exerted against Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, and it also called for integrating the Muslim Brotherhood into the new regime and government. However, it failed in all these uh, wishes because they never came through. A day before Morsi uh, was put on trial, there were two narratives. Washington repeatedly uh, called for an inclusive democracy in Egypt. However, the new regime in uh, Egypt always uh, considered that the Muslim Brotherhood will not be included in the government. Last but not least, Obama, after a Rab'a and a Nahda killings, he said Egypt will never return to what it was before. However, this desire failed because of many uh, points. The Pentagon celebrated the arrival of the first military um, leadership that was, uh, or leader, that was trained in the United States. He is the first military leader to reach power in uh, Egypt. Therefore, it was difficult for the United States to uh, punish their own uh, children, people who were trained by them. The assistance also plays a role in increasing the USA in Egypt. Third, the desire not to take revenge against people who had trained and studied in the United States. I believe Obama's desire to rekindle the relationship uh, was confronted by the reality that was imposed on Egypt. The election of Sisi and the cold welcome and the cold uh, uh, phone call that only came days later from the United States happened, however, Obama mentioned the necessary strategic relationship with Egypt. This is what happened with Mubarak for 30 years, with a very timid call for reforms. Uh, so now we are back to the era of Mubarak. We can call it a Mubarak 2.0 era. I think that Washington wishes for Egypt uh, stability. And I think Washington is concerned with the lack of stability and, <coughs> sorry, with the continuous demonstrations in Egypt. What is said about Washington's uh, influence on what is happening in Egypt occults the importance of external and regional, other uh, external and regional factors. The UAE is financing a very important lobby within the Egyptian establishment, as well as Saudi support. So businessmen in Egypt uh, conduct a great a lobbying and advocacy campaign in Washington in order to uh, uh, deepen and consolidate the relations with Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. With this uh, last uh, address, we would have ended our uh, 
topic related to American approaches to the Arab revolutions. And now we uh, give the floor to the audience. We have a lot of people wishing to intervene. However, we will not have the chance to take a lot of questions and observations. I have not yet received any official request for uh, written request for intervention. We will give the floor to Dr. Ghassan because uh, he, a question was asked by Dr. Abdullah to him. Dr. Ghassan, you have the floor. Dr. Abdullah is not here. However, his angels are amongst us. When it comes to the elections, no matter how free and fair, elections are only one uh, criteria of democracy. Such is a necessary criteria, yet insufficient. There is a long list of institutional and constitutional global criteria, and I believe that even the most democratic countries do not fulfill all these criteria, so it is very difficult to judge a democratic transition based on solely on the criteria of elections. A lot of elections propelled autocratic and tyrant regimes. Also, in electoral sociology, which is a course I give in the university, we know how election campaigns are uh, held. Shak Segela published 10 years ago a, a book about elections talking about the fever of the ballot boxes. He said how he led 14 presidential campaigns around the world, and he succeeded in fulfilling the, these criteria around the world. We had studied when studying uh, uh, political sciences, a course about uh, uh, universal uh, elections against democracy, and that democracy doesn't uh, have to, do, to go through elections. Elections are but what part of the game, one part of the criteria. It is uh, one of them, and it is insufficient, I believe. Dr. Haifa. My question uh, is addressed to Dr. David. As I understood, this rhetoric is based on the U.S. policy, which uh, in turn is based on uncertainty. We also heard yesterday that the U.S. policy since uh, the beginning of the 21st century has been uncertain. My question is, is being uncertain not a policy or has it become the new policy? And what does this uncertainty have to do with with Iraq's invasion and occupation. Was this also part of this policy? We know very well how planned it was and the, how many decades it took. The last point you have mentioned uh, has to do with the Gulf and Saudi and the Iraqi stances and their perception of what is taking place as an intifada, as an uprising, rather than a Daesh or ISIS or ISIL as some people call it. Do you believe it is also an intifada? Aren't you committing the same mistake that the uncertain U.S. foreign policy is making on, uh, regarding the neglect of some parts of the Iraqi people and embracing blindly the um, current mainstream like media that, perception? Uh, that the, the issue of tension between interests and values um, is not necessarily accurate, although I know it's been repeated here and it's repeated in Washington every day. Perhaps um, we could speak about a tension between short-term interest and long-term interests, or short-term, short-sighted politics and long-term national interest. Because as you know, democracies are, of course, complicated business. And if you want to run again and again, and if you want, we want to win for Congress and for the White House, and so on and so forth, you need to make sure you appease and you do the, the safe thing and so on and so forth. But the, the long-term national interest of any democracy, and especially a superpower democracy, is to make sure that everything else is transparent, predictable, visible, 
uh, accountable uh, uh, in, in the world. And so the, the, the actual interest of a superpower democracy to have democracies around the world. Because when they are democracies, then they are visible and transparent and accountable and lawful. And hence competing with them, doing business with them, and even being dominating vis-a-vis -vis them becomes easier. It is the long-term interest of the United States, not you know, the, the values of a beauty pageant, I want peace and whatever around the world, that, is, that are important. And hence the tension is between politics and policy. The tension is between the short term and the long term. And, and in that sense, even in the case of genocide in Syria and, and so on and so forth, whether it was Rwanda and Bosnia and, and et cetera, it is also the long-term interest of a superpower democracy to make sure that the law is respected around the world because when the law is respected and other countries are open dem democracies and, and liberal economic democracies, then the long-term national interest of the United States is served well. It's not a question of values and interests, it's not a question of short-term interests and long-term interests. Dr. Abdul Wahab. Hadrat Dr. Abdul Wahab, thank you. I start where my fellow colleague, uh, Mrs. Haifa, has ended. My question is to Dr. David. I have a sense that think tanks and decision-making circles in the United States are occulting themselves or shying away from certain specific concerns who is dealing with the government that the occupation has propelled to power in Iraq. And those against it are being dubbed uh, terrorists, terrorism supporters. I think there's a misperception by the United States that has also destroyed the, the main message of uh, the U.S. entrance into Iraq. I think this is all due to the fact that think tanks and decision-making circles in the United States are overwhelmed or, uh, yes, they are overwhelmed by this stereotype. I think the lesson that is uh, that the United States has to draw is that what happened in Mosul and the defeat of the forces that were greatly financially supported and backed by the United States should present a, a lesson whereby those people did not believe in what uh, they were trained to believe. These soldiers ended up leaving their uh, posts because they do not believe in uh, practicing what they were uh, or um, uh, putting the orders into practice. I think we need a new approach related a new approach, an approach of dialogue with the multiple sections of the Iraqi government, uh, the Iraqi uh, state, the Iraqi people. We do not believe in the approach that was adopted against our country by those occupiers. I have a few short comments, very simple. I think the debate about foreign policy driven by interest and value is useless debate. Is that in the past and today, all government foreign policy is driven by interest, period. This is true of the US and true of many, many other country if we study the foreign policy of the U.S. in the 20th century, from the very beginning to the very end, it was driven by interest. The idea of value used to camouflage the real interest, value is followed or pursued only if it's jibe with the interest of a given policy. That's as simple as that. And finally, Obama is not a stupid. 
why not interfering in Syria? He already been bitten by what's happened in Libya. He's already been bitten by what happened in Iraq. I think one of the speakers have written a book about the case for invading Iraq. And today, he is also encouraging hitting Syria. And I guess he did not learn from the lesson of Iraq. Iraq is a mess because of that intervention. Uh, Libya is a mess because of that intervention. And Syria is a mess because of the foreign intervention in Syria. Let the people themselves uh, resolve their issue and their problem. Thank you. Shukran, Dr. We kindly ask the speaker to use the microphone. Mr. Mohammed, the question is to you. Do you think that Sisi's visit to Russia and uh, his appeal to the Kremlin, do you think it, affect, uh, it affected the relationship with the United States? Uh, did it uh, insight? Or did it stoke the U.S. fear from losing Egypt as a main regional ally? Dr. Badr Shafi from Egypt. My question is to Mr. Radwan and Mr. Mohammed. When it comes to the U.S. policy, Mr. Radwan said that the U.S. policy towards Syria has failed. Is it a failure or is it an American lack of desire to intervene? When uh, one of you spoke about pressure by some uh, big U.S. businesses, do, does uh, the United States truly re uh, react to such pressure? Because we've seen them uh, intervene in multiple regions without the approval of the Security Council. Mr. Mohammed Al-Afandi. Appreciation to the speakers, uh, and my question is directed to the, uh, Mr. David. Uh, it's related also to the trade-off between values and interests. How can we assess the U.S. policy both based on the following statements? The first one is there is no trade-off at all between interests and values. Rather, democracy is used as an instrumental to achieve U.S. interest. If democracy could ensure U.S. interest, then democracy is welcomed and supported. If not, interest come first. The second one is trade-off do exist between values and interest, but not on the basis of uh, sustainable fashion. Rather, it's case by case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, um, my comment is for Dr. David Pollack concerning his intervention uh, when he talked about uh, the marginal role of uh, the U.S. In, um, in, in the Middle East in general. Um, I, I, I agree with him when it comes to Tunisia, for example, and I think that one of the reasons of the success of the Tunisian uh, experience is, of course, it mainly due to domestic uh, uh, reasons, but also because there is no uh, significant role of in big powers like the U.S., for example. And I would say, alhamdulillah for Tunisia, they have been blessed by the fact that they are not a strategic country, and so there is no one messing uh, up with their, you know, uh, internal and domestic affairs. Uh, but when it comes to other countries, and especially when it comes to Syria and to Egypt, uh, I frankly question what is your definition on uh, understanding of the word marginal. Uh, because if we talk about Syria, it is very clear that the country that decides of what gets in and what uh, as, in terms of military support to the Syrian rebels is decided by the CIA from the uh, uh, Turkish border and the Jordanian border. They are, it's the CIA which decides which types of weapons gets in, which quantities, and to whom. Uh, 
So uh, it is very clearly monitored by the USA, and we know very well that the stalemate that exists now in the USA is mainly, uh, sorry, in Syria, is mainly due to this uh, uh, situation. In Egypt, it's the same. Um, thinking or, or, or claiming that I the USA has a marginal role in what happened in Egypt in the military coup uh, in July uh, 2013, I think this is uh, not an accurate description of the American role in the region, and especially in Egypt. We know, I mean, uh, Saad al-Din al-Brahim, for example, himself, you know, declared in an article in the new, uh, I think it's an interview in New York Times, I don't remember exactly the article, and the journal, uh, but he said that we were told by the U.S. if there were any, enough people in the streets, uh, then we will, uh, you know, be happy to uh, support uh, the military coup. So uh, this is, you know, I think uh, uh, um, I think there is a need to define what is the, the term uh, word marginal because intervention doesn't mean or having a role doesn't mean necessarily to intervene militarily. Uh, there are other ways to be uh, 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 to intervene and to intervene successfully and to be a major player without having to send uh, uh, you know military uh, troops uh, in the region and thank you very much <laughs> okay okay two minutes thank you very much uh, for your comments uh, and questions um, I will say that, uh, first of all, I am not the Pollock who wrote the book. Yeah, I apologize uh, for that. Okay. I That's a, no apology necessary. I'm just correcting the record. Uh, it's an honest mistake. Uh, I did not support the U.S. Uh, intervention in Iraq, and even though I was in the U.S. State Department at the time, and in fact, when I got back from my first official trip to Iraq, in 2003, and I was asked, what should we do? I said, get out. Uh, but nobody listened to me. But that um, leads me to a much more important, not a personal point, which is that, uh, and it, it, I think it relates to the question, the first question that was asked, um, which is that I, I don't believe that the U.S. is responsible anymore for what happens in Iraq just because we overthrew Saddam Hussein. Uh, we spent 10 years um, fighting in Iraq, losing thousands of soldiers, spending a trillion dollars trying to put or help Iraqis put themselves back together. And it's no longer our responsibility. And um, I think that that uh, is true of most of these other situations as well. It is the responsibility of the Arabs to put their own house in order, first and foremost. And um, blaming the United States for the problems in these countries or in the region as a whole, unfortunately, in my view, quite honestly, is just a way of evading responsibility for your own destiny. Taqrir al-Masir. It's your destiny to determine, not the United States. And so that leads me to uh, the question that was raised about how marginal or how decisive the U.S. role is. I'm sorry, but the facts are otherwise. Whatever Saad Adini Ibrahim says, or anybody says, the truth is that the CIA does not control everything that happens on Syria's borders. And the truth is that the United States did not instigate the military coup that overthrew Morsi. These were things that were done and are done by people in the region and by powers in the region, whether it's Turkey, or whether it's the Gulf states, or whether it's the Egyptian people, or whether it's the contending factions in Syria, or whether it's Iran and Hezbollah and Russia who are intervening in Syria in a infinitely more decisive way than the United States has or probably will. And so that is why I maintain my contention that the U.S. role in those situations is marginal. Uh, whether you would like it to be greater or lesser, 
is a different issue. But the reality is that the U.S. role is marginal. Now, let me turn to the question of short-term versus long-term interests uh, and uh, a, qu a related question that was raised here about the tension between interests and values. I agree that in the long term that in the United States, as in almost any other country in the world, in the long term, interests trump, interests take precedence over values in determining a country's foreign policy. And in fact, in my presentation, I argued that that is the case over the last four years with the Obama administration's policy toward Arab revolutions. Uh, it started with an emphasis on values, but it became, bit by bit, as it now stands today, uh, an emphasis on interests, not on values. So yes, interests do take precedence. But that doesn't mean, in my view, that values are meaningless and that they have no role whatsoever in U.S. foreign policy. I don't think that there's a good reason why the United States would support or even accept the results of elections, for example, in Arab countries that brought Islamist governments to power, except for the fact that the United States does have a real interest in promoting democracy as a value of the United States, not an interest, a value. And finally, on the question of whether or not it's in the long-term interest of the United States, the long-term interest of the United States, interest to promote democracy because democratic regimes, as the questioner argued, are more open, are more uh, willing to be good economic and other partners of other democracies, including the United States. That may be the case. I don't know. I'm not sure, honestly. But my point is a different one. My point is that even if the United States wanted to promote democracy in Arab countries as part of its long-term interests, we couldn't do it. We can't do it. This is something that the Arabs themselves are going to have to do or not do. And it's very curious to me, as I said at the very beginning of my presentation, sitting here in Doha to hear people talk about how the United States should promote democracy in this region. Is that really, honestly, what the government of this country wants here in Qatar for the United States to intervene here and turn Qatar into a democracy? We don't want to do it and we can't do it, even if we wanted to. I will try to be brief as to the principle of the use of force and why is it that maybe 90% of the Syrians support the use of force in Syria. In 2005, the principle of uh, interference to protect uh, protection of the civilians, which took the shape of a covenant of the United uh, Nations, this can be in seven stages. First, by uh, negotiations, then sending envoys, sanctions, building allies. وهذا يعني استخدام القوة يجب أن يكون sometimes and ultimately there is no way of stopping genocide and stopping these massacres, uh, crimes against humanity or war crimes without the use of force. The question is now that after the use of force, how can you manage that state? Last week, for example, I was in Kosovo. Almost in, in every government building in Kosovo, you see a flag 
of the United States. You almost feel that Kosovo is the 51st state of the United States. And the main square has a statue of President Clinton. But you see nothing of the sort in Iraq after Iraq's occupation, because the American administration in Iraq established a sectarian regime in Iraq, which divided the country, whereas in Kosovo established a different system altogether. It protected the country. So therefore, the use of force is not always negative. Of course, if it's not authorized, if it does not have the necessary reasons and conditions, but uh, in the case of Syria, there is no other way of stopping these massacres against the civilians in Syria without the use of force. Thank you. Dr. Manshawi, one minute. In response to what Mr. Harbi said, the visit to Russia uh, impacted some uh, Congress uh, men. Uh, the Egyptian army is uh, armed and equipped with American equipment, and its doctrine is an American one, so their attitude uh, will not change. The, Ameri the Egyptian uh, officers like uh, General Sisi and uh, Subhi and others love what everything that's American, American weapons, visiting America. They love America more than anywhere else. So therefore, any orientation towards Russia was not feasible. Now we have a 10-minute break only. And please, it's, uh, it's 5 to 11. 5 past 11, please make sure you're back in the hall. Thank you.